Welcome to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast, the podcast where we learn from cybersecurity experts how to stay safe, private, and secure on the cloud and in code. CSCP is hosted by Francesco Cipollone, your cybersecurity friend with a passion for all things cyber and sharing stories of other professionals with you. This episode is brought to you by the generosity of Phoenix Security Limited. Phoenix helps startups and enterprises solve complex software security supply chain visibility by leveraging the power of correlation and contextualization. Discover how Phoenix Security helps CISO and security engineers act fast, prevent burnout, and implement DevSecOps at the speed of cloud. Phoenix Security. Correlate, contextualize, and act on risk with one click. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. This is your host, Francesco Cipollone, Frank for Friends. And today we are diving deeper on a topic that I've been quite involved with and one of my passion projects around data science and nerding it on data. <laughs> so I have Jay Jacobs, the co-founder of Scientia. Interesting story. Uh, we'll discuss. We'll dive deeper on on the Scientia in a second. But Jay, welcome to the show. We've been talking so much offline <laughs> that I wanted to bring you on the show. <laughs> Tell us a bit more about you. How far do you want me to go? Do you want me to like go far back about me, or just a quick overview? How did you start in cyber? How did you like? You're a data scientist at heart, and how did you get in that intersection between data science? vulnerability management, exploitability, and give us also an overview of, of uh, EPSS for the folks that's the few folks that still don't know what EPSS is. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So it actually, it goes really, really far back for me when I was 10 years old in the early 1980s, uh, just to date myself, my, my father worked for IBM. And so he would bring home prototype equipment and things that he was playing with. He was I think a a systems engineer or something. And so he'd bring home all his weird equipment and I would always play with it and see what made it tick and all that stuff. And so we had a computer at home very early on. And back then, you know, the only thing that you could do with a modem was call a BBS, right? A bulletin board system. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the good ones were long distance. And so at a very young age, I explored, I think I'll use that term explored, explored phone companies (laughs) and how they charge their long distance and how long distance actually works. And so that got me super interested in security. And at a, at that young age, you know, I think it was a teenager then, you know, just exploring security and the different ways that things aren't really meant to work, but they still work that way. And that that's been a, a lifelong curiosity, just computers in general. And I was, you know, programming at a really young age, you know, on, on various equipment that my father would bring home. But that got me really into security. And so even when I started working professionally in IT in probably mid 90s, I was doing like early web development, you know, in like 95, 96. And I had a CEO of a company say, yeah, you can run our website. It's probably just a fad anyway. You know, it was like 95. (laughs) Internet will never be a thing. (laughs) Right. It'll never catch on. But, you know, and it just, it was always a spark of interest. And then in the late 90s, I got into pen testing stuff like that. And, and, and then I slowly migrated into cryptography and I was super into cryptography doing essentially on the engineering side, not so much the developing algorithm side, but putting in products and evaluating products for their cryptography use of keys and all that stuff. And that led me down a really deep rabbit hole. And I was often like, I was the cryptography guy for a number of years at a few companies. And it was really hard to get out of that role because everybody wants to talk to the cryptography guys. So they always wanted me to do that. And so it's hard to get out of that role. But that led me down this hole of like, where do you put these keys? How do you actually, you know, like the cryptography, the math is largely solved, but the key, like, where do you put keys? Do you put them on disk? Do you put them in hardware security modules? And then you've got a hardware security module. How do you authenticate to that? And where do you put that authentication token if you need to reboot a machine from scratch, you know? So it led me down this path of risk. How do you mm-hmm. measure how much is too much risk? And that was a huge black hole for me. Just suck me in. And I started a I started a group called the Society of Information Risk Analysts. Ended up, we ended up making a nonprofit. It's still out there, still doing really well. They have annual conferences that just have tremendous speakers. Sierra, 
I think it's Society of Inforist.org or something, but really great group. And so I started that group with a couple of friends of mine. We thought we'd have, you know, 20 people on a mailing list or something. And I think it's into the hundreds now and the, the conference every year is over a hundred people attending and stuff. So, but that, you know, talking about risk was a huge thing and how do you measure, analyze and communicate risk? And that was a natural transition into data. So like, if you want to measure risk, you want to get data, get feedback on what is going on in the environment and analyze it. And that is statistics, that's data science. And so I went back to school around 2010, 2011, I was at Verizon. I was working on the data breach investigations report, doing data analysis and visualizations. I'm like, I should probably really learn this stuff. So I went back to school for statistics <laughs> and that was extremely helpful. There's so many ways that you can screw up data, you know, by, by thinking it's easy or something like that. So having that statistics was a huge boon. It's just math, my, right? <laughs> it's just math. Yeah. No. And, and I mean, the big thing actually I learned in school is how to read statistics you know, just mm. the math formulas and being able to comprehend some of these concepts because the, the teaching of the, it was terrible. You know, the teachers didn't care and it was just, it was wow. a terrible experience, but I did learn how to read papers and learn new stuff. And so I think I've learned way more out of school than I ever did in school about statistics. I'd say it's every IT student ever. <laughs> right. It gives you the backbone. So, you know, talking about Verizon data breach investigations report, started doing all of that, had a really great time. It was really just an enormous publication at the time. Mm -hmm. um, every year, you know, people would wait for that thing to be published. I think they still do to some extent, but yeah. it's a little less than that. But... And then uh, the guy who started the DBIR, Wade Baker uh, and myself, really enjoyed doing that. But it was sort of difficult with Verizon to really branch out and do some crazy creative things. And so Wade and I ended up leaving and we tried a few other things for a while and we ended up coming back together to try and do DBIR like research again. And we started Scientia and one and Scientia is basically there to do data driven research and publications and help, you know, get through security data, understand what it's doing, do data viz and all of that fun stuff like that. But it's really catching on. People like data visualization and especially yeah. in the in the app sec of Vuln management, I think was a refreshing things. I think because it makes Vuln people look cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one of our early customers was Kenna Security. And they of course did still do through Cisco now. They've been acquired by Cisco, but doing vulnerability management and very early customer, probably five years ago now, five, maybe even six. But, and we've done nine volumes of research with Kenna, and I don't think we mentioned their product once in any of it. So it's all, <laughs> it's all just data-driven research, what's going on in the vulnerability landscape. And part of working with Kenna, I started realizing that there's, you know, evidence of exploitation out there around mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. And we're, at the same time, we were doing some work with Fortinet, and Fortinet has this massive network of devices out there. You know, and they're doing a lot of detection of exploitation activity, exploitation attempts, and recording them with meticulous detail, which is super helpful, um, which is rare, actually, getting getting meticulous detail uh, in the right data being collected. But anyway, with Fortinet looking at the exploitation activity and kind of having their own exploitation activity, as well as a bunch of other data about vulnerabilities, I was thinking like, hey, we could bring this together and like really do something interesting. And that's where EPSS was born. We did a early paper where we just created, uh, essentially it was like volume one of Kenna, we turned into a, a peer reviewed academic paper. And that was sort of the pre EPSS stuff. When was it? it well, it was pre EPSS. And it was, we didn't actually present, we presented a model, but it was really black box. Like we hardly went into it. And it was a machine learning model. But then the second paper that we actually launched EPSS was a much more simplified model. I think we had 16 variables and it was a very simple logistic regression. We had a thought, you know, like CVSS, people wanted to implement this in a spreadsheet and have it with them and they, they score it and they could tweak it and all that stuff. And that's what the first version was. It was 16 variables that you could do in a spreadsheet, very simple, consistent weight for each variable that was derived through statistics uh, that would predict probability of exploitation. It was the first one was over the first year, which was a there's a lot of details as to why that is. But that's and this is the birth of EPSS then. And 
really nothing, nothing really happened during that first run. I think we did a talk at Black Hat in 2019. Michael Reitman from Chemist Security and I did a talk at Black Hat talking about this. And it was, it was I think we had like t- over a thousand people in the room at that Black Hat talk. It was probably one of the largest audiences I've spoken live to. Um, and so we did that talk. And then after that, we started talking about making a, might've been a right before it, but making a SIG out of it. And, you know, Sasha Romanowski, who I met through conferences and just being on panels with them, super into this sort of thing. you know, he did a lot of work, does a lot of work with government agencies and things. He's a researcher at Rand Corporation, but him and I started talking about what we could do with it. And we decided to see if we could turn this into a SIG, a special interest group through the first organization. And we did that. And then we also realized around the same time that we could centralize that model. Because right now we were asking everybody to go find these 16 variables, make sure that you knew them, and then you could plug them into the formula and score it yourself. We had this realization that like, hey, it's, you know, we're, we're in 2000, you know, late, almost 2020 at that point. We can centralize it. We, we have APIs. We've got all sorts <laughs> of stuff. People are online all the time. You don't need this offline thing anymore. So we decided to centralize it. And that just opened up a huge range of possibilities. We could now do complex machine learning models, do advanced analytics. We could go out and do our own data collection. And given the data that we were collecting, we had a whole bunch of stuff. And we could use that and put an API out there that centralizes it. So now we don't have right. to have people go monitor all of the exploit code sources. You know, We're doing that in one place, doing it well. So, and that's why V2 came out with a much more complex model. And that's when we shifted to exploitation in the next 30 days. And there's an interesting shift behind it in the model that I could totally geek out on, but we don't have to. <laughs> and that, that's what V2 was. It was a much more complex model and you can't really see what's going on. All you get is a score in the API. Well, that's the beauty of it, I think. I think so too. That was the beauty of EPSS. There is a lot of, like, out of my experience, there is a lot of interest in tweaking out. But then when you see the ripple effect and the complexity and the variable, you say, just give me the score, man. (laughs) I just want to, I want just a number to decide on. And the single number, I think, has been been the beauty of EPSS. At least from my perspective, I like because it's it's a clean one information and then you can agree or disagree on it, but it is one right. piece of decision point. Yeah, exactly. And it's a very specific number, right? It's the probability of, of exploitation activity being observed by our data collection methods anywhere on the internet in the next 30 days. It's a very specific number and it's a probability. The other great thing about a single number is that we have to do this in- interesting dance with vendors in the space and consumers. Because vendors, we need vendors to participate. We need people to share Mm -hmm. data with us. And obviously, if there's a company involved in vulnerability intelligence, in theory, they should have very low interest or desire to share it with another company, another agency, whatever, doing vulnerability prediction like this. But since it's just a number, we don't divulge any of the vulnerability intelligence or anything behind it. they're, They're much more willing to share. Right. And so that's that dance we have to do. We have to give something out to the consumer to make it useful, but not too much that people don't share data. And the key is that data. Like that is what makes EPSS work is the data partners. So we need to keep them happy and make it likely that more people are going to join without giving away value in their data. You know, so this derived score from their data is something they're not doing. And essentially it comes back to them and helps them because now there's this one number that everybody can see and agree on, and it's out there. And Or disagree on. Will it disagree on, but also you can extend it, right? It's just talking about this probability of exploitation in this case. There's all sorts of other things that EPSS doesn't look at, you know, compensating controls, the impact, the all these different things, you know. And if you do have intelligence about something being exploited, don't look at EPSS. So threat intel vendors still are getting that benefit of saying this is being exploited. That is incredibly useful and if you have that be, don't even look at epss you know like you don't need it but you have a lot of folks that don't have that and can't afford threat intel because threat intel is well it's getting cheaper and cheaper and it's getting yeah. more precise as well so there is organization like gray noise organization like shadow service that works with mm-hmm. us 
that are that are sending these free and open source kind of trade intelligence show them as being the one pioneering this. So there are good data set out there, but having that point in time that alerts you, yes, you're a big organization, you have this and you have this exploited at scale. And then the company like yeah. us, vulnerability management, that tells us, yes, any of these in here and this is the owner. I think those are three different use cases that can Very. live yeah. together. But at this what I like of EBSS is like is crowdsources and open source intelligence yeah. for everybody. So for all the organization have made a massive difference on on burnout right. and deciding what to fix first. Yeah. And I yeah, so like like we we're saying, like if you have that intelligence that says it's being exploited, act on that. But for probably the majority of companies, they don't have that, to your point. Mm-hmm. Like they just don't know. Or you know, like you may have that information for a few dozen vulnerabilities, but then the other 200 beyond that, you don't have that, you know? So you may have that for a few, but you need help on the rest, you know? And that's where EPSS sort of fills in that gap with just just releasing that number. It's the rest that kills a lot of the organization because what is the distribution of EPSS? How many, how many above or what you I'm gonna I'm gonna just declare heresy, but how many would you yeah. consider high? <laughs> we debated on the bucketing for long. <laughs> it's it, you know, as we've talked about on the SIG quite quite regularly, talking about what is high and EPSS is a, a question of you know risk tolerance and threshold and stuff. And my tolerance <laughs> isn't gonna be yours, but you know, I think I think we can talk about what's odd is like a 0.05, a five percent chance could be considered high. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if we map to effort and CVSS, I can't remember what, what that table showing, but like a 0. 0.05 is equivalent to what, like a point, I mean, a, a CVSS 8.2 and above or something. I mean, it's something right. crazy like that. And so like, if you, if you take CVSS seven and above, you know, I think in the data I was looking at, it was like 58% of the CVEs had a seven or above, and that's going to be like 0. 0.01 something in EPSS. So, you know, like it's it's a little hard to people to grasp because most of the vulnerabilities are rated really low, mm-hmm. right? I think like 10% of the CVEs have like above a 0.02 or something, 2% chance. Like yeah. a very small proportion of CVEs are rated high in, in air quotes for those who don't see me doing it in person. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's, that's sort of a hard thing for people to grasp because like they'll see like, oh, it's 0.02 on a scale from zero to one, you know, at 2%. That seems super low, right? There's 98 scores above it. But I mean, like, that's also why we're including the ranking percentile. So like a 0.02, I'd have to check, but it, you know, it's like in the top 80% at least you know, uh, or the top 20%, 80% are scored lower than that. So it's a little hard talking about the distribution of EPSS scores. In a nutshell, there are a a lot of, a a huge number of vulnerabilities that could be potentially re-scored or reduced or tackled later maybe, or when your risk tolerance is decreasing and decreasing. And you can focus on the one that are actually exploited at scale. Now, an yeah. interesting debate and argument is uh, on the new stuff because EPSS also measured the hot stuff that is out there mm-hmm. and everybody's looking at, but it's the new stuff that gets you punched in the right. face. And that's that's the trade right. intelligence argument as well as I think the two things can co- live together very well because EPSS yeah. gives you focus, non-focus on that, focus on that because this is popular, so it's... it's kind of easy to get and easy to get yeah. to. But then there are mm-hmm. the spear, like as we had the Log4j originally, the movie transfer and all the other kind of superstar vulnerability iron skin right now that, yeah. that really gets you there. And if you're one of the first victim, you need threat intelligence and you need early detection, I guess. Right. Yeah, and I think... The, the log for shell stuff is a great poster child for this. And we even have an article <laughs> on the EPSS website. And I think in the article, we're like, hey, if you're checking EPSS for log for shell, you're, you're doing security wrong. Like you don't, like you can do it after the fact and be like, how would this have helped me or something? But like, mm-hmm. I think log for shell was hitting the headlines like and trending on Twitter, you know, like the day before the CVE was published. You know, like it was already a hot topic before that CVE published. And 
EPSS is fully automated. There is not a single human in the loop. There's no nobody sitting there going, oh, this seems like it's going to be big. You know, there's nothing like that. It's all data driven. And so like, first off, we're not going to score it before the CVE is published because we don't know about it. We're waiting for mm -hmm. things to be official, to be published as a CVE. And so that limits the, you know, what EPSS is looking at. But that I means still a published CVE is still the majority of what organizations are tracking aside from the AppSec stuff, which I hope we talk about. But, you know, the, the CVEs, once, once it's published, then we're going to get an EPSS score. But there's a lot of things that feed into that, you know, is, has NVD added the CVSS vector yet? Do we know the CPE information that NVD publishes? What about the CWE? Do we have, you know, any evidence of exploit code being published anywhere? You know, and I think for that one, it might've, we might've had something initially, like it came out fairly high out of the gate, but it wasn't, you know, like the showstopper that everyone knew it was. And we, we saw the score bounce around based on updated data rolling in over the next few days. And that's exactly what EPSS is going to do. It's going to react to the data that it's able to collect on a daily basis. And the score will jump day to day, especially early on as we're getting more and more information. This episode is brought to you by the generosity of Phoenix Security Limited. Phoenix helps startups and enterprises solve complex software security supply chain visibility by leveraging the power of correlation and contextualization. Phoenix platform connects to your repositories, scanners, and cloud, correlates all the information, and provides you with a prioritized list of vulnerabilities that need to be addressed first. Discover how Phoenix Security helps CISOs and developers remove friction and maximize the use of DevSecOps professionals at phoenix.security. Phoenix Security. Correlate, contextualize, and act on risk with one click. That's what we need human to actually look and discern that data and say, okay, this and this and this. But the amount of effort that you used to require to actually look at this data individually has been like dramatically turned down by EPSS and yeah. can be automated by a lot of us that do full management at scale. Yeah, but I mean, like how many how many log for shells have we had? You know, I mean, like, well, log for shell we've well, had one. And at that scale, I think we've had one. I think it's clearly been one of the biggest headline grabbing, everyone needs to cancel their weekend plans. Well, um, but, Heartbleed or the or the next Open SSL, Heartbleed? we had yeah. we had several scary yeah. factor while we were distracted. Uh, Iron Skill was the big one, and then we we, we lost Movie Transfer. That was a very, yeah. very tactical, very. I think nobody could envisage that because it was nation driven, was nation state driven, was a very tactical one, targeted, yeah. similar to but the good and my, old. My point is, we can count those on our fingers. Yeah. You know, like we don't have. There's over two hundred thousand now CVEs published. The challenge is the 200,000. Like if, you know, if you see things grabbing the headlines and trending in social media, go address it's it. It's already too late. It's already too late. But you know to react. Like you don't have to wait for the CVSS score, the mm -hmm. EPSS score or anything else to, to know what to do with it. Like it's right in your face pretty much at that point. By the point, it's too late to your point. You don't need a scoring system. But we, the problem is we need we burn out as security team. Like, why do you need all hands on deck for a log for J for every log right. for J? Because the challenge is as soon as you get the headline, knee jerk reaction of executive is like, I don't want this in my system. And then right. start arguing with that. Like, this is buried down the stack. This is a third yeah. party vendor. Like log for J was such a headache because it is embedded in so many yeah. things that you can't control. As right. your staff, others, other people's staff, other people that need to patch your operating system or your appliances out there. So those are the hard things that I think vulnerability management helps and EPSS help uh, driving and accelerating at scale. I think identifying and discerning what is highly likely uh, back in the risk game, what is high impactful, highly exposed, non-highly exposed, and that helps driving and avoiding burnout. But on There's, the upsec scale, uh, yeah, EPSS has been interesting, and you know it's my baby upsec, so right, <laughs> I nerd on that all the time. But it's been really difficult to find a way to predict um, 
typology of attacks. And yeah, you and I have talked extensively on the use of EPSS and CWE and the, and the implication or challenging in doing that. I mm-hmm. think it is on, on certain elements, you have a lot of CWE or CVE right now registered for library, like Log4j was one, OpenSSL right. was the other one, and we have more and more being registered in CVE. But then we have right. the CWE that is an interesting attack methodology description for AppSec folks and the MITRE and attack and CAPEC that is the opposite side for more attacker and defender, more pen testing kind of view. How do you see EPSS playing in that space or not? It's a good question. It's it's difficult because, I mean, one of the reasons that EPSS works, like I was saying, there's no human in the loop. And so we're able to grab completely disparate data sources, data sources that are, have nothing to do with each other, and then we can combine them because they all use a CVE ID. When you get into AppSec, that's gone. You know, you can't, you can't grab two disparate data sources from this company and that company and have them perfectly line up. You're going to get some things, you know, like some of the obvious things, but CWE then becomes one of the things that you can align on across different data sources. Hopefully, hopefully they at least have CWEs. So, but the challenge for EPSS is like, if the only thing you have is CWE and you want to predict how likely this is to be exploited, I think there's a lot of other variables. So it may not be the best predictor. The other interesting challenge, I think, is that when a CVE is published, there's going to be so many other data points that an attacker can consider as well, right? And so like, if somebody's going to go after a company and try to exploit a vulnerability, they may not care at all about the CWE. They may care about, is there something in Metasploit, right? Can I just go grab that and hit a (laughs) button and it works, right? I don't care what it did. I just hit a button, right? So the CWE may not matter at all. So using like some of the data for published CVEs and looking at the CWE, we may get some noise going over into AppSec because an, a custom application being compromised is going to be more about scanning tools and stuff like that. Like how how easy is it to discover SQL injection, cross-site scripting, whatever, you know, how easy are those to discover? And then, you know, start looking at what actually makes and how things get exploited in AppSec. And I think, I think we're still young in this field. I think we've got a lot of potential would be the correct word because it's it is it's super exciting there's there's so much green field and things that we can explore and learn about and it's just it's super exciting to to work in and around this field no it has been in the past two years i've seen really this blooming and the conversation between infra or traditional infrastructure cloud is another beast that we haven't even tackled and the fact that, well, you're not going to have a lot of CV in the cloud because they're addressed even before somebody blinks because of the ripple effect right. of those. But you have a lot of misconfiguration that are non-classified. And then you have AppSec, as you said. But in AppSec, I've seen an interesting trend in the past 10 years where we, we kind of as a, as a team or as an organization or as a community, we have agreed on the top 10, on the top 25, that are the more commonly exploited. And those have changed dramatically. If you look at the OS top 20, uh, OS top 10 over the past, from 2017 to 2021, they've changed dramatically. Some of them like cross-site scripting has stayed there or authentication failure have stayed there. So there are some trending of like, this is something that gets you hacked all the time. But also I've seen a trend on the other stuff that is, a lot of applications are now building blocks and you use a lot of open source, you use a lot of building blocks, and then you develop a little bit of custom code or code around it. So that's the, the stuff that gets you possibly hacked if it's targeted. But a lot of the other stuff is basically a sausage factory that has CV, but it's pretty much standardized. And that's where all the open source analysis have come yeah. into play. And I think that is where... There is some consistency because it's, I think, where EPSS and this kind of data plays really interestingly and well is if you have like a log4j, a library that is deployed across the space, okay, might not be reachable, and that's a whole different rabbit hole, 
but at least it's consistent. If it's one set of CVE that are linked to one specific product, that could be just your similar stuff that you have on infrastructure and your open source and your uh, software that you have installed is basically a piece of software that you have installed somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually I, I got feedback the other day from someone a little upset saying that EPSS wasn't useful to them because they were looking at some library vulnerability and EPSS scored it relatively high. And they were saying how wrong it was because most of the libraries that were you know, being imported did not expose the vulnerable function, right? That that it it wasn't vulnerable, and so it it didn't have the reachability, and so they were they were upset because EPSS was essentially sounding the alarm, but the vulnerability was not exploited, was not reachable, and so they were upset with me, and and I was like, but I I didn't like it, it, that's it's not EPSS. To be exploited, you know? Yeah, I didn't. I don't have a, a, any comeback for that. So, but that, I think that's a huge problem when you get an AppSec is that reachability and is it actually exploitable and how, you know, what proportion, I heard some stat, it was like when the, there was a company ex, uh, scanning a bunch of containers and it was like 85% of the things brought into that container were never used. Mm. And they were just like sitting there and, you know, and so like people would scan a container and list all the vulnerabilities, but like 85% of that code is never touched, yeah. you know, so like not exploitable. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to to improve on the scanning tools to really get at that issue as well. And then once we start getting there, I think the to your point, what we've been seeing is a lot of data analysis and visualizations popping up around vulnerabilities and AppSec. And I think that's a beautiful trend. And I hope we keep going down there because I think <laughs> as we as we start scanning these containers and things and seeing if they're reachable or not, let's grab that data. Let's you know start to look at what this looks like over time. What are the trends? What are the the bigger picture stuff that'll really help us? I think move this this field forward. And I think the beauty of the data and and is a field that I dig into more recently is you can't like, well we can have an opinion on data. You can have different statistical element of data that, that drives you into one opinion or another. That's an interesting thing. But you can't argue too much with data. You can say it's also black or white. You can just say well, the data sets, the data yeah, sets where you've taken it. It's it's hard because, and like I've seen some, some research that I absolutely did not agree with that was 100% data driven. And I don't want to call out a specific vendor, but they were saying like, hey, the, the time to remediate was, or, or no, it's the time to exploit. And they were saying it was like 80% of the vulnerabilities were exploited in the first 10 minutes or something. And then you look at their methodology and they're looking at like 40 vulnerabilities that they like handpicked and like, you know, 40 out of the 200,000. And it's like their sample size is 40 that they put in there on purpose, you know? And so like the data for them is not lying, but the methodology and the science was terrible. You know, it's a terrible takeaway, super scary statistic. But, you know, the, the data analysis was correct. The data that they were looking at was correct, but how they gathered it and used it, like there was, that was, it, it was, it was in mind. So you can absolutely create things that are totally wrong, that are hundred percent correct from a data perspective, <laughs> you know, and that's part of the challenge. I think it's a story that you tell around data, but what I like of EPSS is that of the SIG has been, I think it's, it's been the most bashed through formula that is not yeah. open out there, but the results have been highly debated and it's highly transparent on like, this is what it is. Yeah. And this is what I really like of the group and the discussion that we're having that not, we don't all agree on it, but at least we discuss and debate about it. And I think it's been one of the success of EPSS because it's so out there. And anytime I get, you know, like I'll do a presentation on EPSS or something, I'll get a question. I, I usually get at least one person saying, yeah, but like, here's this flaw or something that's wrong with EPSS. And I like, I think every time I've gotten something like that, my first response is absolutely like, yes, this has the, you know, it has data bias. It has, you know, you can't, it misses uh, impact and the compensating controls. Yes. It's missing all that, you know? And, but they're usually valid. And the, but the, the point to all of that is like, what do you do instead? Exactly. So what? <laughs> it's like the point of open source, like a lot of people or, or a point of, of back in the day, uh, back 
uh, circling back the whole discussion, risk quantification. I'm not going to do risk quantification because I have too little data, so I'm going to just judge with my gut. <laughs> and that is better judgment than driven by data. There, there's a debate to have there. But yeah, I mean, like, it's the same <laughs> sort of thing, right? Uh, you know, so like, the the what we're looking at is has flaws, but what is the alternative is to try and sit down and score, you know, 200,000 CVEs by hand? Is that the solution? And how correct are you going to be there? What is the bias that's going to be there? And so I think, you know, given all things right now, I think EPSS is one of the better things, specifically when we talk about that threat element. And I think it's going to outperform anything, anything that we've been able to study so far, it's outperforming definitely CSS. But again, CSS is going after a different measurement Problem. thing to measure whatever severity is. And so, yeah, I think it's compared to what is the question? Like, yeah, CSS has, <laughs> I mean, EPSS has some bias and some challenges, but when you're saying it's not performing well compared to what, right? Like expert opinion. And that's very difficult to scale. Also, you know, so that's the big thing. Like people have objections yeah. and that's, as you're talking about in the SIG, we bring these up and we talk about them like, Hey, what about this? And, and data bias is a big one. And, and the big question is how, how do we attack that? How do we, you know, so like we we've gone through three versions already. I'm already thinking about the next release that we're going to have, adding a few more data sources, but we want to try and improve, you know, like we didn't just create the first ver version and like sit down and be like, uh, kick our feet up, we're Bound. done. No, no, no. <laughs> like I'm really excited for like EPSS version 20. Like that's going to be so awesome. <laughs> back to the future, back to version one. <laughs> yeah. Back to Excel and the local model. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, like that's a not to transition to a whole other topic, but there are use cases where people do want Excel, right? Like P certs, for example, a P cert team, product, you know, support, I don't even know what P cert stands for, incident response team, a product mm -hmm. group and a and a vendor. They want to be able to score all of the vulnerabilities that they are working on to understand what is a priority and what isn't. And they do not want to first, it's not a CVE yet. Right, but they will be CVEs, and I think there's a valid use case there. And there's a few other use cases. Some are really interesting, but the, that's one of the main ones. So, like, can we create something like EPSS and make it an open thing where, like, you could go set some variables, like, hey, I have a vulnerability. It looks like this, uh, and then what are the possibilities? Like, if exploit code gets published in Metasploit, what's going to happen to the score? If if this happens, what's going to happen? You know, so like a lot of what if, and that's something else is it's on our task list. It's been on there for a year, probably be on there for another year, you know, volunteer driven, but yeah. And that, that's the other thing I think um, just to conclude is, is the whole uh, objective of like open source and objection yeah. against open source. Like it is still three, four guys in a room developing and putting their open source tool yeah. together with the sponsor of it. So agree, disagree, use it, take it for face value yeah. and just be grateful. <laughs> and, you know, start, have that be a starting point and let's start to measure how it's performing. And hopefully if we start looking and measuring how performing, we can do better next week. Mm-mm. And, and participate in the discussion. Like I like the fact of the SIG because we all sit down, discuss. Some of us agree, some of us completely disagree. We yeah. just conclude the discussion and we take it, we note it, and we move on. And I think that that has been why I've been so passionate about EPSS overall and so involved in the discussion because it's a beautiful discussion and yeah. it's all data driven and opinion driven and there isn't any opinion that is more weighted of the other one despite the fact that we have sponsors in the room so i think yeah. it's been a very clean and good forum and if nobody has listened to it i'll encourage everybody to listen to those discussions because it's yeah. beautiful the various use cases yeah and there's a lot of really great people in there too so Absolutely. And yeah. we unfortunately we come like to to time. So we need to wrap up. <laughs> Otherwise, we're gonna get into a yeah. rabbit hole of different things. And maybe we, we do a follow-up of version X amount, version four <laughs> on, yeah. the, on the history of EPSS. But if yeah. you wanna we have a tradition here to to leave basically everybody with a warm and fuzzy feeling. If you wanna give a positive message about the whole discussion and cyber in general. Uh, yeah. In the past three years, what would that be? 
in the past three years. There's, oh man, I mean, like there's so much cool stuff going on and it's, it's so hard to narrow it to the last three years. Cause I, you know, like you can really see it when you go back 20 years, you know, I think back then Microsoft was still fighting, you know, talking about vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Now Microsoft was one of the best vendors and their response to vulnerabilities in general is way better. And I think, I think actually that's one of the cool things that I'm seeing a really positive thing that we need to stop blaming the vendor and to think like, because this vendor has talks about their vulnerabilities, they're crappy or something like, absolutely not. I mean, you know, working in AppSec, everybody's going to have vulnerabilities. There is nobody who is immune to having vulnerable code. Let's accept that and let's move on. And I think we're doing that. I think that we're starting to see that, that, and through all of this data analysis and visualization and I think now, especially with like the GPT stuff where people can bring their data in there without any sort of previous experience and just visualize it and roll around in it. I think, I think it's a great thing. And I think it's just, it's so fun to be working in this right now. Uh, And so I I think there isn't a a terrible thing in this industry, you know, that I could think like, like there's so much more positive than negative, even though typically we're a cynical bunch that focuses on the negative. There's so much positive. I think that we're we're moving at, at such an incredible pace and it's so fun to be a part of. And I think I've seen a positive change in, in a field that is can be gruesome, like vulnerability management yeah. can be really heavy, really taxing in terms of things to look at. And mm-hmm. EPSS plus all the effort that we've done has made life of people different. And I think it has touched a lot of people. Yeah. And that's that's why a lot of people have gone very passionate about this. And, and yeah. I think that's that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. So cool stuff. Let, let, let's leave it on that. Jay, if somebody wants to uh, read more about EPSS uh, or the thing that you write or the early papers, um, where can they find all of this stuff and where they can find you? EPSS is at first.org slash EPSS, relatively easy. And then my my day job at Scientia is C-Y-E-N-T-I-A dot com. And we've got quite a few things on there. And That's probably the best. Or LinkedIn. You can reach out to me personally on LinkedIn is where I spend some time on social media. I do love this topic as I hope came across. So if people are like, hey, I do vulnerability management and I have something to say, like I would love to hear it. So definitely reach out and just let's chat. It's fun. No, it's been it's been a pleasure having you and and having this discussion. You know, I love this topic more than anything. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. And out there, if you haven't tried EPSS, go out, try it out, see and have an opinion on it. Use it in the context where it is intended to do. So don't take it, take it at the face value, contextualize, prioritize and use it, participate in the discussion and evangelize out there because it's a tool that is out there, open source, and hopefully will always remain open source. Yeah. And is a fantastic tool to actually focus on what matters most. And thank you, Jay, for all the work and the time that you dedicated. And I'm sure at version four, we're going to have a follow up. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everybody else, stay safe out there. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcast and post it on social media tagging Cybersecurity Cloud Podcast for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Discover other episodes at www.cybersecuritypodcast.com. 